It's just full of corruption Now it's time for the 99 Cause we're drinking quarter waters and throwing sipping wine They talk about strikes and union dues But they have no answers for the real issues Like a livable wage and enough sick days A pension plan for the retirement age We are the U-N-I-O-N And we're taking a stand and we're organizing We're taking control of our destiny Like a fearless lion, you can't mess with me Cause we have the right to organize So don't get deceived by the yeah. fear and lies They try to be slick what? and offer us bribes And ask for second chances just All like right, the wolf so cry. we're back for the second episode of Unite Podcast So today on the podcast we have John Crocker Who's our industrial officer And Hannah Schaltenegger Who is a cinema organizer the um, reason we have these guys here today is John has been dealing with a significant amount of redundancies and restructures um, since COVID and even pre-COVID. Um, so he's a bit of an expert, in my opinion, on that. And Hannah, being the cinema organiser, that's an industry that is doing massive restructures across the country. So she's here to, let's just have a chat about your experience with restructure and the... <laughs> I'm sorry, Hannah, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, we don't know what's wrong with her. Um, one thing I have to say, I have to say is, is that um, Hannah may have to leave in the middle of this podcast. She's taking a very important call from the media, ironically, about restructures and cinemas. So keep an ear out on that. On Is it the news? Who's, who's, who's contacting you? The news of I don't know who they are, but I'm sure we'll find their show somewhere. So um, uh, during the week, uh, we've sent out a few posts out asking our members to ask us any questions they might have with restructures. Unfortunately, our members never wrote to us, but um, I prepared some questions, and that's just purely based on um, in the past people what, the questions that people has asked us on restructure. Um, if you are watching this live and if you do have any questions, you're welcome to post it up and I will read it out and hopefully John or Hannah can answer it. Um, so, how are you guys doing? Good. Been really busy recently. But yeah. Yeah. It's all died out a bit at the moment or is it still going, John? Uh, I think we're over the first wave. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're going to be waves. That's depressing. I think we'll, yeah. I think we'll talk about the waves of restructure a bit because it's people think this is it. We'll talk a bit more about that. So I think the first first question, and it's it's a question that we get asked, well, I got asked quite a lot when dealing with restructure, is what is a restructure? So a restructure is a process that a company goes through when it wants to rearrange its affairs in a manner that is more than trifling. So companies change their operations day to day on the fly, manages the constructions, they try things, that's all good. Um, when you're making significant changes that impact on workers, then that's a restructure and it requires a consultation process. So at the lower end, you might have a roster restructure, that might, a significant roster restructure, um, and that can go all the way up to um, mass layoffs that we've seen today. Okay, I guess, you know, when you say changes in day to day operation, when does it become a restructure and when does it become, oh, just, just a tiny little tweak on your roster? Because one thing I've seen over the years is little tweaks here and there over time, it becomes very different from what you initially were hired to do. Yeah, that's a good question, Shirley. So anything that seeks to vary a contractual term, um, that's a restructure. That's very, very solid. Um, the, the test is whether it's going to have an impact on the worker's um, job and how much of an impact it's going to have, really. So companies have a good faith obligation. And from their point of view, it's better to consult more because that makes them um, safer. It means they've met their duty of good faith. Mm -hmm. 
the, the more they make changes without consulting, the more they risk breaching their duty of good faith. Okay. We'll talk a bit more of the duty of good faith, maybe in another podcast, because that's a term that's thrown quite a lot by unions, but I think very little people actually understand it. Um, me, it took me years to understand what it actually meant, so we'll talk about that in a later podcast. So I guess the question, the second the second question is, is that why would a company go through restructure? Because it is a long, painful process, and if they don't do it properly, there's a lot of legal consequences behind it. Why not just stick to what you stick to what it is? Um, is there a number of reasons for that? Uh, you could be quite innocent, like they're just trying to take the business in a slightly different direction and they want to change their opening hours or something like that. That's the thing, change of opening hours, does that count as a restructure? If it changes people's contracts, if it requires a change in the contracts. Do you think that could be the reason why so many contracts we see, whether it's IEA or even the collective, that is so vague when it comes to certain things? Imagine. Yes, yes. I mean, there's an advantage to a company in having a vague contract because then it gives it more discretion to do what it likes, mm -hmm. um, which is detrimental to workers who prefer the certainty of knowing when they're supposed to show up to work, what they're going to pay, and things like that. How many hours are going to work each week? So, yeah, um, more detailed contracts probably benefit workers more, and more leeway probably benefits companies more. I mean, they, they talk about how useful flexibility is. So companies that only just, suits them, isn't yeah. it? Flexibility only one way. Very much so, yeah. Um, that seems to be the way it's, it's put out there. So companies can, as Hannah's mentioned, look to restructure to innovate. Um, they can face external pressures uh, that can cause restructures. Um, sometimes a company expands to the point that it needs to restructure, or what we're seeing today is that companies are contracting to the point where they need to restructure. Alright, so Pretty much restructure is when the company realise they need change within itself. Yeah. All right. Um, this is a um, this is a question I get asked quite a lot: is will I lose my job during the restructure? You might, but you'll be told at the beginning. So a restructure necessarily comes out as a proposal. They have to consult with the workers and have to take the workers' views into consideration. So they can't say this is what we're doing. They're saying we've got this idea. What do you think about it? Now, that initial proposal will mention whether there is any chance of job losses as a result of it. So if we're saying, we're, going to, we're proposing to change your rosters, will you lose your job? Well, no. Um, if they say, look, we're looking for a reduced headcount, someone might lose their job. Uh, it, might not be the, it doesn't mean that every worker that attends a restructured meeting is going to lose their job, but to make someone redundant, you need to go through a restructured process. So not every restructure is scary. A lot of them are quite harmless. Um, but the one you know, when people get made redundant, that's as a result of the restructured process. Because that is that we know, like if we ask our receptionists, um, whenever there's a restructure in certain areas, they're going to get a, a lot of phone calls going, "Oh my God, am I still going to have a job at the end of this?" So if we can say to people, "Is is that you need to actually look at what type of restructure it is before panicking?" Because I've always said to my members, "Hey, don't don't freak out until we know what it is." Do you think that's yeah, a good that's message fair. for people? Yes, it is. Um, I mean, it's a time of stress for people and we need to reassure them. So, yeah, we should be reading those proposals as well. And having the answers ready to go for when they call us. But, yes, people need to, to pay attention because if they're not, if they're panicking unnecessarily, they're not doing themselves any favors. So, take a minute, read the proposal. If your job's not on the line, you can calm down. And also, I think it's important to not also go too far the other way and get fooled by like, language that might make you feel too comfortable um, when they're just kind of, I don't know, like saying they're going to look for voluntary redundancies first to reduce headcount and then suddenly you get to a process that's rapidly sped up from something that seems quite harmless to your having a redundancy proposed to you. It's a really good point and we had a, a joke with the casino the other day because they're using this HR speak and it's not going over with workers. So a worker goes into the meeting and is told, all right, we decided to disestablish your position. And we was like, oh, thank God, I thought I was going to lose my job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even the word redundant is not always as, you know, understood as people think, like, you know, like, it's, it, is a, it is a legal word. People don't always understand. Like, uh, I mean, some people thought it meant that the duties they were doing were no longer required, but they would find other duties for them, yeah. which is... That's pretty really weird. actually. 
Well, they didn't, unfortunately. <laughs> Outside of that employer is what they meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we, we can go into that later, but there is an obligation to redeploy. Yeah. However, if you're actually reducing headcount, then there might not be enough jobs to go around. Yeah, which yeah. is the current, we'll yeah. talk about that a bit later. Um, but, you know, well, what's interesting with restructure is, is that I've actually seen the other the other side of it, where at the company you go, oh, we're going to do a, a restructure, and you have a few people who go, yes, I get my money and get out of here. Mm. Um, it does, I have to say, that it does happen, but I, it, it is quite rare in a lot of places. Um, but so just 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 be careful, people, when the company mm. says restructure, because it may not necessarily be what you think it is. Um, the next question is that, what do I get from a restructure? Well, in theory, what you're supposed to get is the opportunity to fully review what the proposal is. So if it's a change of hours or a reduce in headcount and have the reasons put to you as to why that restructure is necessary. And then you're supposed to get the opportunity to give your feedback to participate in the changes that are going ahead there. Employees need to consider it. Um, and then depending on the outcome, that's when things start to vary. Oh, so... Um that's exactly right. I mean, three key points. You should get all relevant information. You should get the opportunity to comment, and your comment should be genuinely considered. Okay. Um, what do you mean genuinely considered? Can you guys give an example on that? <laughs> um. it's, it's kind of one of the tenets of good faith, which comes out of natural justice. And that's, um, the restructure needs to be a proposal, so it can't be a foregone conclusion. Uh, so if a worker has a really good idea that is, if you can prove that what you've, your feedback hasn't been taken into account, then that could be a problem for the company, that could be a legal breach. So they need to come in with an open mind. It's not the easiest thing to prove, but um, it does need to be genuinely considered. It does need to be um, a, a genuine proposal. So one way actually of, of seeing that is um, the company would, which you would expect the company to respond to the feedback. If they had just said, thank you for your feedback, we have genuinely considered it, you'd probably push a bit harder for, mm -hmm. for more of that. Um, and another way, that another thing you'd be looking for is often employees, they get really creative and they, they work really hard to get the put in feedback that will save jobs and um, prevent people being disadvantaged. So they'll put in a whole bunch of feedback, a lot of which will um, you know, save the company money or be cost neutral, might just require a little bit more effort. Things like, um, Getting creative play job sharing arrangements and stuff. So if you see things that like are actually won't cost the company anything at all, um, will still achieve their aims of downsizing or whatever, and that hasn't been looked at, then you I, you can push very strongly against that. I would say. So everything we're talking about here is what we do as organisers, and obviously we can often see a bigger picture than most workers. How can workers ensure? the company is doing the right thing when it comes to the restructure. Because we, as a union, we do monitor restructures and we do take it very seriously, especially at Unite. Um, but we can't be everywhere at once, especially when it's in the current situation when you have a nationwide restructure. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there will be certain things that we could miss. How can a worker help us to help them with a the restructure? I think the best thing workers can do is um, is act and think collectively. Like they're all in this together. They should talk amongst themselves, uh, particularly with their delegates. Make sure no one's missing anything. Share their ideas with each other. Find out what's good, what's bad, what's going to work for the majority of people, or what, what will work for everybody potentially. So, you know, you don't want to get scared and go into your shell. You want to band together with your other workers and really. Um, do as much feedback back to your union uh, official who will probably be the one writing the feedback. Just come up with, yeah, lots yeah. of good ideas. Just keep the chatter going. Keep the morale up. Um, try and shut down any rumor or speculation that's not based on something solid. Because um, it is just the pressing time going, going through restructures, isn't it? It's, it is depressing. And there is a tendency, I think, for people to, to get, um, go into shock and try and um, withdraw and, and whatnot. And, yeah, I think it's really important to fight that instinct because um, this is 
because any time at all in your employment life, it's not the time to be shy. Like you need to be over communicating. Um, if there's a question that you're too embarrassed to ask, because it is a legal word, there's definitely someone else who doesn't know out there. So ask it. You really need to be um, anything that doesn't feel right or feel clear. You really need to be getting them to explain it to you because part of those legal requirements is that you understand what's going on otherwise you can't participate. Yeah, ask lots of questions if you're working. One thing I have to say is, you know, we see a lot of migrant work and so being a migrant myself, you always get told, oh, if, if you're not needed, that's it. I think one thing a lot of migrant worker needs to realise is restructure and job loss in New Zealand is very different from many other countries that they could be used to where they come from. Have you guys seen the case where you know it's unfair, but because that worker is migrant, they just kind of go, nope, too hard, we're, we're just going to take whatever the company throw at us. Does that happen? Yes, yes. I think it does. Um, I think a lot of migrant workers come over here without the highest expectations, and sometimes that is matched by the employer. <laughs> um, and yeah, that, that, that ex those expectations can be built into the relationship so that when the employer starts talking about the relationship ending, the migrant worker can just, you know, think that's it, I'm at the bottom of the heap, and just accept what the employer says without realizing that they're in New Zealand and the employer has to operate under New Zealand legal framework. All right. Um, I, I think that's that's some question. Obviously, there's a lot more question when it comes to restructure. And one thing we've learned over the years is that every restructure is different. But um, if you do have any questions, as people who listen to this podcast or watch this live at the moment, please just contact us, and we'll try to answer your questions as best as we can. Obviously, if we don't take care of the companies that you work for, we might not be able to give you the specifics, but we'll try to help you in some ways about it. Um, you know, the at the moment, like I said before, we're going, we're seeing a nationwide restructure, and it's not just because these companies that we're dealing with is nationwide companies like cinemas. There's cinema chains all over the place, hotels. There's New Zealand is a big tourism industries and. The hotel is probably one of the industries that got hit the worst. The casinos, even though there's there's still a few casinos around, I guess you know how is how is this restructure differ from other restructures that we've seen in the past? So, in a structural sense, they should be the same. Um, what we've seen, and we're running a case against the casino about this, is that in some cases, and it's just one of the one hotels. Um, some employers have decided that because of the uh, lockdown that they don't have to follow the law anymore. Um, we don't think that's right. We think the courts will agree with us. So there have been some restructures out there that have been much worse than normal because employers think that the rules don't apply because we're in an emergency. Right? We don't agree with that position. So aside from those ones, these restructures um, are normal, although we're not seeing a whole lot of you know, roster changes or reporting line changes, we're seeing headcount reduction. So there's definitely a very strong theme. And I guess the other issue is that there's so many coming at once. You know, we're flat out, the companies are flat out. Um, there's a lot of pressure on the people involved in the restructures, including the workers who are obviously on the receiving end. But um, yeah, there's a lot going on, a lot of wars in there at the moment. It's, uh, it's a very scary time for everyone, isn't it? It's, it's a horrible thing. Um, um, I guess the other thing is, is I've, I've seen this in a few companies that um, companies has used the kind of the excuse of COVID as a form of restructure. Can a company do that? Not really. Um, some companies we've heard, I think the warehouse is one example, uh, have suggested that they were looking at this before the virus was in the world. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, they're saying that it's, it's not that related to it, it's just something they've been to all along. Um, so, no, they can't really mix the two, but the problem is, is that it's it's so easy to predict a future revenue decline that companies can justify headcount reductions because there's every indication that we're going to business around in the next few months and years. I think there's a real moral issue with that as well because if your employers aren't there, 
who had plans to restructure or downsize um, prior to this, they're really jumping on the bandwagon of stress that everyone is in. Sure. And that's, you know, that's employees who are scared. Um, this is the last thing a lot of people need on their plate. Isn't exactly. It? It's, yeah. I try to lump it all together, I think it's really unfair. Yeah, if, we, if you were going to do it beforehand but you hadn't done it yet, it probably wasn't that urgent. So I don't think they exactly. need to do it now. Yeah, especially since there is some, you know, like there is some government assistance mentioned out there for employers to get through this. And it's quite easy to tell, you know, when when companies use COVID as a excuse almost for restructure that they yes. want to plan, isn't it? It's, yes. Do you have any really examples obvious. of that? I've <laughs> uh, only yeah, seen a couple where the proposal is just to shut um, entirely, shut up shop entirely, whereas other branches, uh, just to reduce head count, it's kind of like, oh, what happened here? It's, it's, it's definitely it's, um, adding fuel to the already burning fire of COVID, isn't it? Absolutely horrible. Um, one thing with this, this COVID restructure, let's call it that for now, is that there is a funding for government which has never previously there. I guess you've always had the unemployment benefit, but this time the government actually announced something else for COVID. Do you go for one? Well, um, I'll just comment that I haven't verified this, but the finance minister did comment that they had done something similar in the wake of the Christchurch earthquake and mm -hmm. another example. So I think he said this was the third time that they were doing this. Oh, okay. First time um, I've so ever heard of it. It seems to be something that the government is prepared to pull out in an emergency. Um, so what was the question? What is it? What is it? Um, so there are, there are two things going on at the moment. Um, so the government announced a wage subsidy back in March mm -hmm. uh, that was paid to employers who then had to pass it on to their staff for 12 weeks. Uh, that was extended for another eight weeks. So that's the wage subsidy. What the government announced a few weeks ago is called the income relief payment. So that is instead of the unemployment benefit, if people have been lost their jobs since March 1, as a result of COVID, they can apply for the income relief payment. The income relief payment is considerably higher than the benefit. It's $190 a week for full-time workers. The full-time payoff is 30 hours. Um, your partner can earn quite a bit of money before there's, uh, and you'll still be eligible to it. And the other main restriction is that you can't get too much redundancy, but the cap is set very high for that. So it's an additional benefit that is available for people who've lost their jobs since March 1. That's untaxed as well. Untaxed, yeah. Four not taxed. And more than just there with other benefits that you might imagine. That's pretty good on tax, and I guess that's one thing. I think the government has realised there's going to be mass unemployment due to COVID. Um, so that's, I guess it's a good thing that they're doing this. Overall, it's a lot of money going to people who need it, people who've lost their jobs, so genuinely overall it's a good thing. However, there is a lot to be criticised about that scheme. Um, so... <laughs> I think the first part You can't just drop criticise and not go into details, John. Oh, I'll turn the no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first issue is it, it creates a two-tiered welfare system. So if someone lost their job on the 28th of February, they would be treated completely differently to someone who lost their job on the 1st of March. And we think that's completely unfair. People have different personal circumstances. Um, you could have someone that wasn't working and needed the benefit now, and they wouldn't get the 419, they wouldn't get the regular benefit. So we think that that is quite structurally unfair. For sure. Um, it's, in other ways, it also, what it's doing is it's highlighting problems in the welfare system. So for example, um, this is an individualized benefit. So your partner, uh, as long as they earn less than $2,000 a week, which is quite a bit, that's a six-figure <laughs> salary. As long as your partner earns less than that, you're entitled to this benefit on an individual basis. The most beneficiaries, if your partner is working basically an average wage or less, mm -hmm. um, then they don't get anything. So it's highlighted a lot of issues with the welfare system as it is. For sure. Um, I've, um, I've personally got a lot of this question, and I just want to hear your guys' um, thought on this. Is that, should I take the restriction? Should I take the redundancy pay? Yeah, we can't tell you. So that's a big <laughs> decision for every worker who is facing sure. it, and they need to they need to think long and hard. They need to talk with um, you know their, their family. Uh, they need to consider their finances. Um, our job 
is to give them the best advice possible. So we can help them with the redundancy calculation. Mm -hmm. uh, we can tell them about what we'll get, like the income and earth payment, and what the benefit is like after that. For a lot of workers, well, no, for a, for a small minority of workers, a very small minority of workers who've been at their current job for a long time and have a good redundancy clause, which are mostly at the end of the agreements, they might have a big chunk of money staring them in the face if they choose to walk out the door. And then with 12 weeks of the income relief payment, it might seem like you'll actually be taken care of for a while. And they've put in the, they've put in the years of service uh, and they're stepping out of the way to save someone else's job. So look, if people are nearing retirement age, it can be particularly appealing. If people are thinking about leaving their job anyway, maybe to move town or just to change careers, it is something they should think about because it's a lot of money and these opportunities that trigger redundancy clauses of contracts don't come up very often. And also if you're a worker on a visa, um, it's really important to understand the status of your visa. We've had restructures where we've been worried that um, the workers there, because of language barriers, were not understanding by their circumstances. Like if your visa is coming up for renewal, you really need to look long and hard as to what you should Especially if visa's moved to the employers, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Now, you guys mentioned um, redundancy payment. Now, for me, I didn't realise redundancy payment is not compulsory until I, I, I took the job as a union organiser and realised a significant amount of workers across New Zealand doesn't have redundancy payment. Now, I came from the Sky City background where we had really good redundancy, well, this good, yeah, very good redundancy payment compared to many yeah. other companies. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's good. It's a solid, solid redundancy payment. But whereas yeah. many workers, and my partner's one of them, is that there's no redundancy payment. And we have companies that even we cover, I, I cover on call centers that don't have redundancy. Now, uh, uh, we we know why it's important, but I think for a lot of workers, it's still it, they don't really realise why it's so important to have redundancy payment. Did you have one comment? It's a difficult. Yeah, it is. It's conceptually difficult because it's the kind of thing you don't need until you need it. It's like why do people buy insurance? Not because they want something to go wrong; they hope they never have to need it. But sure. it's extremely important that you have insurance. And some people don't have insurance because they, they can't afford it or they choose not to go to this. So it's one of those things you need to think of in advance. It's something that we tell members we think you should push for a higher bit of redundancy clause in your agreement. And it doesn't always resonate with people because people think about day to day, year to year. They'd rather sure have a better pay rise. Pay rise. Yeah, mm -hmm. better pay rise, better hours. There are other things they want to focus on. And most of the time that's true. Year to year it is true. But, you know, the last crisis was kind of 2008, so every 10 years or so it comes around that there is an economic contraction, almost like clockwork, and at that point people suffer job loss. And it's when times are good that you need to push for the redundancy payments, because we're not going to be improving redundancy compensation in any of our bargaining this year. <laughs> companies and no, no, that, it's going to cost them if they, if they need to enact those clauses, so they'll be very resistant to that. So it's something that employers are prepared to give away when they're confident, when economic times are good, and that's when it's least on workers' minds, which is why it's difficult to be good You answer. really shouldn't have said the 10-year thing, because now <laughs> employers are going to think, when we get to the 8-year mark, they might be a bit harder at giving us the redundancy payment. I think also when redundancies happen, they take everybody by surprise usually. For sure. Like if you're, um, most of your, you know, like costs like that, like you can you can try and foresee your living costs and your expenses a couple of weeks in advance. Ideally, if you can, like it's hard, but you can try. But like an earthquake's just going to come. You know? Like you don't, no one can prepare for that. And so like that's when redundancy clause kicks in and we'll look after you. At least you know how long we're looked after. And you mentioned that a lot of people don't have redundancy and they don't. Um, internationally, uh, there are laws where redundancy compensation is mandatory. We don't have that in New Zealand. There's no statutory requirement for redundancy. Historically, um, when there was more union coverage, uh, a lot more people had redundancy clauses, but with the decline in that, um, people outside unions very few of them have redundancy. And it's even as unions, it's for many companies, we have we had to fight them tooth and nails to keep what little redundancy payment that we have. Yes. And I've, I've personally has had 
disagreements and even arguments with members who wanted to trade redundancy off for pay. Um, and it, it is a very sad thing to see, considering many workers would rather have redundancy than not those that has gone through restructures will know the importance of redundancy. Um, That's a good point, actually, is that also people need to be mindful that, like, the nature of our work is constantly changing and being innovated by technology. So when you're entering into your, um, you know, your, your, your field or where you want to work, like, within a few years, technology could come and completely disrupt that, or it could be offshore. And so that's another big, big picture concern with redundancy that people don't always think about as to why they need it. The other thing with redundancy is, is that this is, uh, I've noticed that with interesting conversations with management, is, is that it really makes the company think twice before they, you know, when it comes to research. And let's take the hotels as an example. Without even applying for the wage, well, some of them has indicated they didn't want to apply for the wage subsidy, and then we realised that not all the workers there had redundancy pay, whereas certain companies they would actually look for other ways before making people redundant because it's a cost to the company. So I guess if it's not for anything else, maybe workers need to think about that. It's, it's also a security net for them, really, isn't it? It works on a number of levels. That's why it's such a great system. I mean, the first is that the workers get compensation if they lose their jobs. And the ones who've been there for a long time get significant compensation. As you mentioned, uh, that compensation comes at a cost to the company. So companies that have stronger redundancy clauses in their agreements think twice. Um, do we really need to cut these people? Or can we just wait for someone to leave? Um, so it does make a big difference in that respect in terms of them really making sure that it's worth it on their end to go through with the new structure considering the potential cost that people might become redundant. And the other thing is that it, it allows um, workers to sort things out themselves to a degree. Um, so if you have voluntary redundancy and it's, it's a decent redundancy, then it allows those that are prepared to leave to leave and those who really want to stay to stay. So it creates a kind of self organizing fairness amongst the workers where those with long service with more pay, redundancy pay, can leave and that helps those who don't run in that situation. Now, um, that, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's good and we need to push for redundancy as a nationwide thing because it's really important to workers and I think COVID has proven not just on a New Zealand level but I guess at an almost an international level why it's important to have something for workers to fall back on if the job is no longer there. Um, I think that's that is that's for us today on the restructures. Obviously there is a lot more that we can talk about and need and should talk about when it comes to restructure but unfortunately time kind of cut us off here is there anything you guys would like to say on the topic of restructures we might need to go into some more detail later but uh, a worker being made redundant is being dismissed and that dismissal needs to be justifiable or it can be challenged legally and the two standards for redundancy are that it has to be fair and that it has to be genuine so Fair is about the process, was the consultation fair, and genuine is about whether they really needed to make their work redundant. Um, the current economic climate, um, you're probably not going to get very far on the genuine argument, mm -hmm. so I'm um, really focusing on the process, but workers who are made redundant do have the right to challenge the dismissal. Okay, um, so just to make it clear, what we bring back to the original topic is, is that restructure doesn't necessarily mean redundancy. But a redundancy is definitely the cause of a restructure. Caused by a restructure. Caused by a restructure. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you so much, guys, for this today. Um, we will try to link a few links like last time on to here. If you are going through some financial difficulties or you would like to talk to someone um, because your circumstances have been changed significantly by COVID, um, you can always, if you are a member of Unite, and if you have any questions on your particular restructure, please don't, please don't hesitate to reach out on us, uh, reach out to us, sorry. Um, you can either call our uh, reception or you can call your organiser directly if you know who they are. We are here to help. Uh, it's, it is a difficult time and we understand that. But we will get through this. All right. All right, thank you so much, John. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I know I called you guys in the last minute, but um, we got through this. Thanks, guys.
Even lies, they try to be slick what? and offer us bribes and ask for second chances just like the wolf fries. One day stronger. One day longer, one day stronger We bargain together, more strength in numbers True solidarity, this is my family This is our destiny Voted on the 26th in the month of January We made history, we achieved victory Special thanks to Joe Biden and D.C. Al Sharpton, Bertha Lewis, Hakeem, Jeffries We occupy Wall Street We are the 99% of the workers who trying to live right So we formed a committee Thursdays with the Red Team Strong unity, uh -huh. this is now reality. Uh -huh. CWA, I'm not going away. That's the slogan I say when they try to put fear in me. Stop. CWA, red band on the right what? hand, 1109 U N I O N. What my labor sowing We face irregularities with solidarity Collectively bargaining to gain some clarity We're living in poverty, uh -huh. it's really bothering uh -huh. me We're going to the table to end this policy United we stand, uh -huh. divided we beg uh -huh. I'm just a finger in the fist yeah. over your head Check it, here I stand like MLK Like Harriet Tubman in the slavery days uh -huh. Here I stand with the underground movement Going against currents, fighting for improvement this is how we do it, making all the sacrifice, living in darkness, we finally see the light, uh, CWA, we have overcome, divided, we beg, together we bargain. United we stand, divided we beg, we are the union. Church. My respect, my dignity, we are the union. Despite harassment and intimidation, they heard you in Brooklyn. 